Hello again, uh, Dr. Moreno. Hello again, Dr. Lopes. Um, thank you for uh, being uh, today with us. Um, the subject is um, about uh, the recent announcement of uh, Catherine, uh, Princess of Wales, known also as Kate Middleton, uh, which came as a huge uh, shock. But um, uh, unfortunately, um, this announce it's part of a terrifying global trend. More and more uh, young adults are diagnosed, di diagnosed with cancer. So I will begin with uh, Dr. Lopes, uh, asking him uh, if he can tell us which is the primary cause of this issue of more and more young adults diagnosed with cancer. We don't actually know. We have a number of different theories that are being tested and studied as we speak. Uh, moving into cities without a doubt has led to this demographic transition that increased the number of cancers we see at all ages. But over the last couple of decades, we are seeing younger patients developing colorectal cancers, breast cancers, and others. We do imagine that air pollution has to do with patients developing lung cancer, for instance, but we really don't have a clear explanation for most patients. There's a specific cases where you have exposure to carcinogens um, either because of occupational histories or because of um, environmental issues um, such as um, uh, in Antofagasta, Chile, for instance, but we really don't have a good explanation for all or for most cases. Yeah, and um, accordingly with this, uh, uh, can you tell us what is the average age of cancer nowadays because it continues uh, to be a disease of older patients so the vast majority of patients uh, are in their sixth or seventh and even eighth decade of life when they develop cancer but we are seeing more cancers that we used to see in older patients in patients in their 30s and 40s and sometimes even in their 20s because i i was asked asking you this because in Romania the average is between 35 and 40 years old so uh, uh, this this was the reason uh, now I'm passing to Dr. Moreno um, uh, talking uh, uh, about uh, Catherine uh, Princess of Wales uh, which is a boast a mother and a daughter um, we agree in uh, cancer that uh, the emotional factor plays a powerful role uh, most often more powerful than the rational one and uh, should this information uh, be shared with the children and uh, why some families people avoid this uh, sensible subject sure and um as both of you were talking about with this increasing incidence of cancer among people who are younger, um, younger adults were having diagnoses in young people who are either trying to start a family or who are parents of young children. And what we know is that cancer um, is painful and stressful for everyone. Um, but we tend to see some of the highest levels of psychological distress among younger adults, um, particularly those between 18 and 39 years old. Um, the Princess of Wales is only in her early 40s, so she's very young to be receiving a, a cancer diagnosis. And, and so the um, shock that she spoke about is not um, a surprise. And when you have young children, there becomes a decision about what to say to them and, and how much information to reveal. Um, and that's really a personal uh, decision. It's based on how old your children are. If they're very, very young, there's only so much information they can metabolize about um, the diagnosis or the treatment that, that the parent is receiving. Um, but we do know that most of the time it's better to give children some level of information that's developmentally appropriate. Um, the not knowing or the uncertainty um, oftentimes is more difficult for children. And in particular, children tend to have a lot of magical thinking. And so they put together information that they have. And so they can make conclusions about what the cancer means or how it happens that's um, really incorrect or can make them much more fearful. 
Um, children are pretty concrete thinkers. They're most interested in their lives and what will change and be different in their lives and what will stay the same. Um, so there's no need to go into kind of in-depth uh, conversations about cancer biology or anything like that, but for them to have a basic level of understanding about what they're seeing that's different in their day-to-day -day schedules or in their day-to-day -day lives, or that they are able to visualize that's different in their parent is the most important thing. Um, and kids are really resilient. And I think that to your question about why do people avoid it, people avoid it because um, they're scared. They're scared that it, their children will become overwhelmed or that their children aren't ready for that type of information. But most of the time, children who are um, confused or don't have information are left in the dark are actually the ones who struggle the most. Yeah. Um... We all know that cancer means fear in the first place. That's that's the first emotion, and uh, 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 according to this uh, discussion about family, uh, we all know that the uh, family support it's half of recovery. So I will ask again, Dr. Moreno, uh, please uh, uh, talk about the process of the coping if uh, there is something like this uh, in this particular case. Yeah. Yeah, the Princess of Wales talked about how important it has been for her husband to, to be by her side. And um, what we know is that people who feel the support of their close loved ones, of their family, of their spouse, of their partner, tend to do much, much better. Um, but it is a dyadic process because as um, you know, Dr. Lopes and anyone who has treated people with cancer knows, um, the pain of having your most loved, you know, spouse and, and partner affected by cancer is oftentimes as painful as for the person who has received the diagnosis. And so they're both individually experiencing uh, stress and emotional pain, and they're both trying to support one another as well as figure out how to cope themselves. And sometimes they don't fully open up with one another because they're trying to protect the other person from the stress that they're experiencing as they know that it affects their spouse or their partner. So it can be a little bit um, difficult. And so it, oftentimes it's really important for the couple or for the immediate family to have some additional support around them besides just the two of them or just, you know, the immediate family members, because um, everyone is affected in their own way, not just the patient who's receiving treatment. Um, there's a lot of of hurt and, and coping that occurs by the spouses and the partners as well. Um, but certainly having a loving family or loving spouse um, by your side can make the experience much more tolerable and help someone get through the treatment and diagnosis. And now we, we know the psychological part and now I'm uh, turn back to uh, Dr. Lopes and ask him uh, how tough is for you, Dr. Lopes, as an oncologist to discuss with your patients about the acceptance of this disease, of cancer, because you are the first uh, who communicate the diagnosis and the first- Actually, that's usually- have to tell treatment. them that- yeah, we, we, we usually see patients at a moment when they have already heard that they have cancer and where unfortunately, even in the medical community, a lot of people take patients' hopes away, and that is the worst that you can probably do, especially as today, we do have a number of different treatment modalities that can help patients live longer and with much better quality of life, even if they have metastatic disease, not talking about the ability that we have today to find many, if not most cancers at an early stage, at least for breast and colorectal, we certainly have that ability, even for lung. Unfortunately, we don't do as much of the screening CT scans we should be doing. But even for lung, we can actually find the disease early when we have a much better chance of cure. So cancer today is not a death sentence by any means. We have much better ability to not just prevent disease, such as by using hepatitis um, B and uh, HPV vaccinations, for instance, but also with things such as tamoxifen or other modulators for patients that are at high risk of breast cancer. We can prevent colon cancer by finding polyps and removing them before they become cancer. So the possibilities today are not uh, what the question actually started with. Of course, when we do have patients with a disease that is metastatic and might be beyond our ability to cure today, even those patients have hope in a number of different treatments in lung cancer, 
we have a growing number of patients who are alive five and more years after diagnosis of advanced disease because their disease has responded to immunotherapies or targeted agents. So it's certainly not that idea, at least where treatments are available and where the healthcare systems actually are able to have patients access them. Of course, when we do talk globally, then it's absolutely right. Most patients in low-income countries in particular do not have access to a lot of the technologies that I just mentioned, and especially not to many of our new treatments that are making such a difference to so many patients in the U.S. Uh, <clears throat> you you talk about uh, some of the procedures on uh, oncology, and uh, I noticed that uh, regarding this particular case, everyone is on social media was talking about this preventive chemotherapy. Uh, can you explain us a little bit? Because uh, sure. I, I guess uh, there will be a, a tendency now for people not so informed to do it by themselves, this preventive... Uh, preventing, uh, preventing cancer with chemotherapy. So unfortunately for that, except for the case that I just mentioned, when you have women that are high risk of breast cancer and we can use the moxifen and other uh, modulators, we don't have any diseases where chemotherapy prevents a new cancer. So we usually call preventative chemotherapy adjuvant chemotherapy. And what that means is if you do have a disease that we can remove surgically, let's say if you have an ovarian cancer or breast cancer or lung cancer, depending on that tumor's characteristics and the patient's characteristics, we would be able to provide certain treatments that can try to help the disease from coming back. So try to prevent the disease from coming back. Some of these treatments are chemotherapy, so medications are classically seen as chemotherapy agents, but we also have hormone treatments for breast cancer, we have immunotherapies, we have targeted agents for lung cancer and others. So there's a huge number of potential treatments that we can use in what we call the adjuvant setting, technically as, as medical oncologists, and these are modalities of treatment that can try to help the disease from coming back or at least prolong the time that a patient is disease free. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Moreno, uh, <clears throat> uh, I will uh, ask you, let's say, a uh, direct question. Is the following statement true or false? Cots, uh, coping, it's a fight between fear and hope at the end? Um, so I would say false. Um, yeah, you know, as a psychologist, I think we try to move away from binary options, you know, one or the other. Um, you can have hope and still be scared. I think anybody who receives a cancer diagnosis will have some level of fear that's normal. It's expected. And we don't want to pathologize that. We don't want people to expect that they have to be sort of a happy soldier or happy fighter all the time. Of course, if someone gets to a level of psychological distress that is really impairing their ability to follow through with their care or is really affecting their lives, we're going to treat them. We're going to make sure that they have the, the right level of care in order to be as well as possible emotionally and physically. Uh, but we don't want to set the expectation that someone can't be afraid, that they can't have some level of frustration or anger that this is happening, that it's interrupting their lives, that it's affecting their ability to be with their family in the way that they would like or to work in the way that they would like, especially for younger adults. It, it really disrupts the course of their lives, and which is why it's so distressing. So, you know, hope is, is such a beautiful word, and it means so many different things for different people. Dr. Lopes talked about hope can mean one thing for a person with early stage cancer. Hope can mean something very different for another person. And you can have hope through the end of your life. You can hope for comfort. You can hope for time with your loved ones that is um, important and, and allows you to make sense of the arc of your life. I mean, hope can, can take many, many different shapes. Um, but I, I think we just want to make sure that people understand that the expectation is not that they have to carry this experience in any one particular way. It's okay to have the full continuum of emotions. And the fact is that most people will, and that's normal. And I think it's very freeing for people to know that many other people in that situation would experience shock, fear, 
frustration, maybe even anger, sadness, you know, all of that is normal. And that's why we work as a multidisciplinary team to make sure that we do really take care of people who need an extra layer of support for their emotional health. But we don't want to set the expectation that people can't have hope and fear or hope in any other emotion that's more complex or layered. So coping, uh, coping it's more about progress than victory, no? Coping uh, is victory about... Or... Yeah, coping is about living as well as possible within the circumstances of your life. Um, you know, there are going to be challenging aspects to undergoing treatment. Um, but within, you know, those challenging experiences of, you know, surgery or chemotherapy or having to pause certain activities, are we able to give you the support that you need to be as well as possible physically and emotionally in that experience? And that can be uh... so different for every person. And uh, regarding this particular uh, case, can you give us, for example, three coping strategies that Princess of Wales can apply on the Adi coping? Yeah, I mean, like I said, it is individual, but she named two of the most important things. She has the support of her loved ones, and she also talked about being taken care of by a really great medical team. And we know that when people have a strong alliance with their oncologist and with their oncology care team, when they feel like they have good communication, that they're on the same page, they trust them, they're making decisions together about what's best for, you know, her and her care. Those are some of the two prote most protective factors. If you have a really good social support system around you and you have a strong and trusting relationship with your care team, that sets you up for success every time, even in all of the other challenges. And then beyond that, it becomes about, you know, every day just asking yourself, what are the small things I can do that bring me a little bit of joy, bring me a little bit of comfort? And that can be very different. You know, for some people, it's going to be spending time outside or making time to connect with their art or whatever is, you know, already the values and the um, priorities that they have had before cancer. You know, people become full formed humans before cancer ever enters their lives. And it's just about trying to keep them connected to what makes them themselves through the cancer treatment as much as possible, even when there are other challenges that are, are coexisting. Okay. I'm uh, returning to Dr. Lopes and asking also, uh, let's say, direct question uh, How important is time? in the oncological process because i I'm, I'm coming from eastern europe where cancer is still uh let's say a, a non-curable disease and you talk in uh, in the, the west as a curable disease so it's kind of two different approaches but in any of them time how how important is for patient time it's time depending on what you're talking about time. Uh, time is what we try to gain. Try, time is what we try to help patients have more of so that they can do what's important to them, be it to reach a loved one's wedding or a grandchildren being born. So in that sense, time is a philosophical concept that is everything we are trying to gain for our patients and for ourselves in many ways as well. But if the question is more direct about how time or how much time do you have to actually start the treatment, uh, that varies a lot. That depends on the type of treatment, depends on the stage of the disease. Of course, we do want to have treatment as early as possible, but that doesn't mean starting treatment today or tomorrow or even this week or this month. For certain diseases, they are so indolent that starting treatment in six weeks, three months, or six months might actually be enough. There are patients that have diseases that we would call cancer, but probably eventually it will change the nomenclature in the future. Like some prostate cancers, for instance, that are low grade, you could go for years without any treatment. On the other hand, if you have somebody with a small cell lung cancer and you don't treat that disease within a couple of weeks, the patients are likely to get worse. And even more aggressively, if you have someone with leukemia or an aggressive lymphoma, such as Burkitt's lymphoma, you do need to start treatment within a few days. Otherwise, you do impact prognosis adversely. So it is a very broad concept, both philosophically and practically. I, I ask uh, you this because uh, uh, every oncological patient, when heard about this diagnosis, said, I don't have time. 
So the oncological patient don't have time, don't have space, and this is the first question. How, how, how much time do I have, you know, to leave, or if I, uh, I came uh, on time, or I postpone, because usually uh, bad news, we, we intend to postpone them, yeah. Uh, well, there's one more important aspect that uh, has to do with your question, which is uh, we really can't precise for each individual, for each person we're seeing in front of us as a medical oncologist, how long each of us has, even us without disease, because what we get are statistics and the statistics that we get are number one, usually old and outdated because they reflect what happened, the treatments that we were giving five years ago if we're looking at five years survival. And we also get aggregate numbers. So we get average numbers. We know that half of the patients are going to live less than that number that we get, and half of the patients are going to live more and longer. So we really can't precise for each person. And I think that that's an important message. If we are in a system, in a healthcare system, where we actually have new treatments coming along, those updates, those numbers that you get on the internet, they're usually outdated and they are average. And an average is just the midpoint. Um, that may not show, for instance, that 15 to 30% of patients with lung cancer today, even with metastatic disease, can actually get to live for five years or longer as compared to 3% or less a decade ago. And I, as you mentioned, it's extremely important um, the systems and the ability to get access to new treatments because if you don't get any treatments, cancer is still a very dismal disease in many, many uh, ways. Thank you. I'm uh, turning back now to Dr. Moreno. I asked him, Dr. Lopes, about time now. I want to ask you about this, um, let's say, triad of uh, uh, every, which every on, uh, oncological patient have. Anxiety, depression, and suicide, uh, suicidal tentatives. Uh, regarding these issues, how important is psycho-oncological education or psycho-oncological awareness? Yeah, yeah. It, it, the stress, of course, is so important, and it affects. Um, almost every person who receives a cancer diagnosis. I think it is important to know though that most people have some level of anxiety or fear, concern, um, some level of change in their mood that might be sadness or along the continuum of depressed mood. But most people don't actually develop an anxiety disorder or a, a depressive disorder or a clinical depression. Um, that was something that we used to think or we used to assume that, oh, cancer is so stressful, it's so difficult. Most people who get a diagnosis of cancer must go on to have a clinical level of anxiety and depression. And that's not always true. Just because people are not at their typical baseline and you see more emotional richness, uh, including anxiety and depressed mood in their experience as a response to the diagnosis and to the challenges of treatment. Um, most people actually fare relatively well. It's less than a third or less of, than a quarter of people who have clinical levels of anxiety and depression. And what we found is that actually most people don't have elevated suicidal ideation. Um, when you look at the cancer community as a whole or people who have a diagnosis of cancer as a whole, um, you tend to see rates of suicidal ideation um, as the sort of comparable levels as the general population. Um, so you don't always see an, uh, an increased risk for that. There are specific cancers um, maybe that are higher risk if the treatments are really, really difficult to tolerate or if the impact physically of that treatment is really difficult to, to tolerate, then we might be um, looking for that. But the most important thing is most people do pretty well. Um, and we always in, in our healthcare system, make sure that we are screening for higher levels of psychological distress. So higher levels of anxiety or of depressed mood. So when it hits that threshold, 
that it's clinically impacting them. It's impacting their ability to, you know, go about their day-to-day -day lives, to go through their treatment. It's impairing them, or it's just so overwhelmingly distressful, then we have the resources to make sure that we address that. And part of that screening is to also make sure that if someone were struggling and to the point that they had suicidal ideation, that we would also identify that through our screening and make sure that that subgroup of patients that do need an extra layer of support for their emotional health receives that um, additional layer of support for their emotional health. Um, so I think it's important though, not to assume that every single person will have a clinical level of anxiety or depression or will experience suicidal ideation as a result of their diagnosis and treatment. We have some pretty good epidemiological data at this point to know that the, the rates tend to be much lower than we initially assumed given the challenges inherent. Okay, um, I see that we are approaching uh, the final of the interview. I will uh, ask uh, one more question um, regarding the last one about anxiety, depression. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how much do you think that the level of education interfere in accepting the oncological disease? I mean, uh, if I'm a PhD or I don't know, um, doing lifelong learning, maybe I can accept better than a person who didn't had the chance to uh, make a formation, for example, or ed executive education. Do you think that the level of education has an impact of on acceptance of the cancer? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna reframe the question a little bit. So I don't think that people who have lower levels of education have an inherently harder time accepting their diagnosis of cancer or their experience. What we know to be true in our country and in many places around the world, most places around the world, I would argue, is that people with lower socioeconomic resources, which tends to uh, coincide with lower levels of education, tend to receive lower quality care, and they have a harder time accessing care, period, and they have a, a harder time accessing high quality care. And so we, we know that when they receive care, they may not be included in the decisions about what treatments to get, what, what will treatment look like, what's important to them, and the communication between them and their care team oftentimes is different. You know, they may be given less opportunities to ask questions. They may... Um, have less sort of education or information given to them. And this could be because of our own sort of institutional uh, biases against people who have lower socioeconomic resources. And so I think that anyone given the appropriate level of support and care can move through this experience as well as possible. Um, of course, there are challenges, but I, I don't think that there's anything inherent to you know, anybody who might have a lower level of education might not, not being able to um, cope with the illness or not being able to accept the need for cancer treatment following a diagnosis. It's really about the systemic, structural, institutional um, barriers to high quality care and high quality care goes hand in hand with making sure that patients have the level of support that they need in order to make sense of the diagnosis, to understand the information that's being given to them and to participate fully from an empowered place about what you know is going to come now with the treatment and moving forward through their care. Thank you. Thank you very much.